Thank you everybody for tuning in. My name is Valeria Valbuena and I am one of the PGY4 general surgery residents uh, here at the University of Michigan and one of your moderators for today's session. Uh, I am joined by Dr. Samantha Rivard, uh, who's my uh, residency big sister in a PGY5 general surgery resident, uh, Dr. Gifty Kowache, one of our assistant professors of colorectal surgery and the director um, of our surgical clerkship. Dr. Gurjit Sangju, the Vice Chair for Resident Professional Development, and Dr. Mike Inglesby, uh, who's a Professor of Transplant Surgery and Vice Chair of Resident Mentorship. Teddy Engler and Erin Lero are part of our department as well, and they're facilitating uh, today's webinar. Um, we will be talking about how our department is optimizing resident professional development and achievement today. And we are looking forward to answering all of your questions. Uh, we'll be doing so during the length of the webinar, so please use the chat function. Uh, we'll do our very best to get to all of them. Um, we are already having an amazing, amazing turnout today, uh, and if we run out of time to answer all of your questions, um, you, our uh, social media handles are under our uh, Zoom screen, so feel free to reach out there or to email as well. Um, so first, we're gonna have Dr. Engels B, who's gonna start us off with an overview of his new role um, as a uh, resident mentorship chair and how he's preparing residents for their transition uh, into their academic development time. Awesome. Did that work, Val? Cool. And you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. So, um, welcome. Uh, my thoughts are with everyone. I know it's a kind of crazy and a stressful time for everyone. And, um, you know, for years I ran the medical school curriculum at Michigan. So you'll, if you, people like, like to see this in like double time or triple time, cause I'm kind of boring, but you can't do that cause it's like a live webinar. So, uh, if you're trying to speed me up, it's not going to work. I'm going to talk about the lab time. Um, we call it the academic development time here at Michigan. And I think, um, one of the things that makes Michigan different than most other programs is we take our, our academic development time very, very seriously. There's an expectation that you come here, we'll, tr we'll train you how to, how to take care of really sick patients, um, but we'll expect that you do more than that. We'll expect that you uh, think beyond just one patient at a time and you think about foundational problems relevant to health and wellness and specific to surgery and our kind of we guarantee you that we will put you in a position to impact those problems develop into a future leader in academic surgery and provide you with the foundational skills you need um, to do those things and that's kind of our essentially part of what we call the michigan um, promise so um two of us dr sandu and myself have this kind of assignment to steward this process for all of our trainees um, and really our job is to make sure that you achieve academically you have the mentorship you need and you do all this within uh, a community that really facilitates your flourishing in all aspects of professional development and really it's just a it's a great place i think um, the biggest challenge we have with the um, the academic development of our trainees is that there's there are too many opportunities um, so um, based on feedback from some of the residents we've added some structure and i'm going to talk about that structure briefly of what the kind of the lab time, so to speak, is like at Michigan. Um, and uh, so you, you basically do um, three years of, of clinical training, and then in your fourth and fifth year, you do what we call one of these majors. So basic science is done at the Center for Basic and Translational Science. Um, health Services Research is done at the Center for Healthcare uh, Policy, Outcomes and Policy, and Surgery Education Research is done at the Center for Surgical Training and Research. And these are large centers within the Department of Surgery, and they essentially exist to facilitate community among scientists and to facilitate opportunities for trainees. And these are created essentially for the trainees um, to make sure they have the, what they need. Um, and you pick one of these and you kind of hop into this community. Um, in addition, in uh, kind of in addition to kind of a major, um, we also, uh, offer um, other four other centers that are, we kind of consider minor. So um, for some folks, this may be the, the primary focus of what they do during the lab time. Um, but this is kind of a little bit of a less, a path less traveled in academics, but equally important. And we want to make sure there's structure here. And you can kind of be a, do a basic science, but also kind of spend part of your time doing a minor in healthcare administration. So I'll talk about these um, quickly. 
Um, one is in uh, health, uh, is in innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, um, the other one is in global surgery, where you not just serve uh, and do global surgery, but really focus on how to do research in global surgery. Healthcare administration, I think more and more surgeons are called upon to run the large business that is healthcare delivery. Um, a lot of the faculty within our department do this, and we have a specific pathway to teach you how to um, kind of um, get some of the core skills to, to do that in the future. Then finally, health and design. Um, one of our trainees who just finished last year is an architect and has a real um, interest in design. He writes grants on how do you kind of design hospitals and ORs uh, that are most efficiently and effectively do patient care. Um, and it's an exciting, very innovative approach to kind of academic medicine. So during the lab time, we guarantee funding for every trainee. Um, we have a series of uh, ways we do that. One is we have a portfolio of NIH-funded T32 training grants. Um, in our department, these are the ones that are listed. There's also other ones that we, we are kind of co-investigators within other departments. And then we're a primary site for the National Clinician Scholars Program, which is there's a couple sites across the country where we are one of them. And um, we take a national cohort of, of scholars, but many of them, many of our surgical trainees decide to participate. In fact, Val is on the call. She is one. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm sure Val, Val can tell you about that. It's an extremely prestigious program and really gives you a lot of the foundational skills to kind of affect policy change in, in healthcare delivery. So um, I think one important point is um, our lab time, once again, we take it very seriously. Um, but that structure can get in the way of some residents. Some residents really um, have different skills, they have different passions, and we are here um, to support all of those. So we are right in the middle of the University of Michigan campus, and it's one of the largest universities, as you know, in the, in the world, and we encourage our trainees to take advantage of all of those resources. So um, one trainee um, was going to go to Cambridge. COVID messed that up for his first year in the lab because he's kind of already ready for tenure. And we wanted to really challenge him and uh, um, to to see kind of healthcare delivery in the in a in the National Health Service and do some implantation science research. Another trainee um, spent time in Washington D.C. as a White House fellow, doing kind of a practical healthcare policy on a national level during one of his two years in the lab. And we will uh, facilitate, we will support and fund that time in the lab. Um, for you if that's kind of what is in your best interest. Finally, um, we have a very, very deep bench of surgeon scientists that are here. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's no shortage of faculty to work with, um, for sure, when you do your research time. In white, we have faculty who are kind of full-time scientists. In yellow, we have faculty who are clinically active surgeons who have federal funding in uh, research and you can see this list here and it's two pages long so um, you can work with any of these individuals or many other um, individuals who uh, have different types of funding um, to uh, um, fulfill um, your ambitions on how you want to develop as an academic surgeon so we have specific structure around this and i won't go through this in detail other than the fact that um, this process the academic development time really starts before you arrive at michigan so when you come to interview, be prepared to talk about the problems in healthcare and in surgery that make you kind of crazy and how um, you want to think about trying to fix some of them. Now, we will provide you, we don't expect you to have a specific plan, but you need to have a very mature explanation of um, things that um, are broken in the healthcare delivery system. And they could be uh, foundational scientific or they could be policy delivery or anything in between. Um, that is what we look for in our trainees, um, and all of our trainees in, the pro in our program um, come in with an expectation that they're going to do foundational uh, improvements on healthcare. So that is my talk. Um, I think it's, an, it's uh, hard for uh, medical students to really think about some of these things in such a big, uh, in big uh, kind of high level. It is also for kind of middle-aged senior faculty. Um, so we have uh, essentially um, specific teams, um, we call them launch teams, that have been uh, tried and true within our faculty and Sam Rivard has started this program for our surgical trainees and she's going to talk about that now. So Sam, I turn it to you. Dr. Anglesby, that is a great uh, segue. Uh, so Dr. Samantha Rivard uh, is going to share some of the uh, details about our Michigan surgery launch teams and how they play an integral role in our Michigan Promise for residents. Dr. Rivard? 
Hi guys, um, thanks for joining us today. It's really exciting to be able to talk about all these opportunities we have here in our program. Um, I think one of the reasons that I was really drawn to Michigan to come here for my surgical residency was the dedication that I saw um, in a away rotation I did here, but also during the interview day and kind of spending some time here in the department about the real dedication to the development of residents, not only as technically skilled surgeons, but also as clinicians who are very compassionate for their patients, but also these impactful researchers that are gonna go on and change the surgical field. And it's that kind of composite um, surgeon or person really that really attracted me to come to this program. Uh, the Michigan Promise, which you'll see basically on everyone's slides, either in the bottom or is a, is a big highlight, is one of the things that we use to help us develop both attendings and residents. Um, and we're very, very dedicated to that. My personal role in the resident version of Michigan Life is that I'm the achievement chair, which means I focus on making sure everybody is developing appropriate for their year and making sure we have the appropriate programs to pl in place to uh, have every single resident achieve their full potential and even beyond that. So we mentioned these launch teams. Um, this is a program that we like to start an intern year. So you walk in the door and we'll start giving you a launch team, which is a collection of mentors that will help you achieve your full potential. So, so the goals are threefold. We want you to have a formalized mentorship team that knows you, knows your goals, and knows everything about you to make you the best that you can be once you're done with training and even beyond. This will basically be a cohort of mentors that will continue throughout your career probably uh, for most of us um, and uh, kind of propel you forward. We want this um, kind of mentorship team also to be those folks because they know you so well, they're gonna be the ones that help represent you and uh, give you some transparency in all of your evaluations. Because if you read anything nowadays, um, residents always want more evaluations from their attendings um, and they want um, kind of strong feedback to figure out where to go from here. And this launch team helps you get that. And then the last thing that we think is really, really important with these launch teams is that residents can reflect on their experiences. So I'm sure you all have experienced this, especially in surgery, but it is a very fast paced world. And sometimes when you're kind of going through clinical rotations, it's really hard to reflect on the experiences that you're having, even though those, those experiences are completely changing you as a person. So this is an opportunity to have our residents really reflect on how they um, experience uh, becoming a surgeon and how that's going to impact them later on. So just to kind of describe the overall structure of what this launch team looks like is everybody gets a launch team in their intern year and this launch team is very flexible but it will come with you from intern year to your chief year and beyond into graduation. Um, ideally, at the end of your, of your time here, your launch team is somewhere between five and six people, but it does start with one to two people, um, mentors. So again, it's flexible. It can change over time if your interests change, and it's really meant to, to benefit you. And if it's not doing that, then we change it. Um, but there is structure involved. So once you walk in the door, you're our intern, you get assigned one or two uh, attendings, faculty members, mentors, uh, based on your personal preferences that will elicit and your career aspirations. And you don't need to know completely when you get here, but we'll kind of find the people that are right for you and right mentorship opportunities for you. Um, and then every year we ask residents to think about what their career aspirations are, you know, whether it be research or whether it be clinical, and you're encouraged to add a mentor to your team to make sure that you can, you continue to grow and nothing becomes stagnant. So this, this team, this launch team of mentors will be with you in your first three years of clinical time, transition into your research years for two years and come back with you for clinical time for another two years. And the point of that is to create this core set of individuals who knows you knows your entire, your entire course and the changes that you've made throughout your time. It can help direct you um, kind of in the pathway you want to go. Um, ideally, um, so these, these launch teams that are structured will meet about three times a year. The goal is to make sure there's connection and make sure we identify residents who either need some extra help in figuring out um, kind of uh, 
getting through the year or finding weaknesses to improve and also pushing those those residents who are you know, striving um, um, excelling and making sure that they're you're being challenged appropriately so every meeting is structured to your year so your pgy level so interns and let's say uh, pgy sixes will have different structures um, and it's based on the time of year and there's a little bit of pre-work that residents require to help improve that self-reflection so usually the first meeting is to create your annual goals to make sure you know that you're supposed to be um, excelling this year and what you're supposed to be focusing on. The second meeting is to really evaluate how it's going, uh, to talk about um, how attendings and your co-residents are perceiving you that year and kind of identify struggles, weaknesses, strengths, and help build on those things. And then here's when we start talking about adding another mentor to make sure that the resident continues to grow. And then in the third meeting, Again, we review some resident evaluations to see if we've made any improvements, to see if there's anything else we need to work on. And then ideally, this is another time where residents take the time to focus on what happened this year? What kind of surgeon am I becoming? Am I getting out what I want to? Are there things I need to still work on? So this is a very busy slide. This is basically what our curriculum looks like for our PG1, PGY one through seven years. I won't bore you with all the details, just to pull out what interns are really focused on in their first year for their launch teams. Um, so for the first meeting, we're really just trying to figure out who you are. Your mentors want to learn who you are, what your goals are, et cetera. Intern year is a hard year, and if you don't kind of set goals in the beginning, you can kind of get away from you. Uh, so meeting two, you focus on you reading your evaluations, kind of interpreting them together, what do they mean and what can you change? And of course, one of the things we really want to talk about is your work-life balance and how things are going, because we're not just surgeons, right? We're people. Some of us are spouses. Some of us are parents. Some, you know, we're daughters, we're sons, etc. So we're not just surgeons. We're not just in the hospital. There's more of us to more of more than that to us. So we discuss kind of work-life balance here, and again, add a mentor. And then at the end of your intern year, of course, we'll talk about evaluations again. How did the year go? What can we do differently? How is PGY2 gonna be different? What are my goals for that? Um, and I just wanted to give everyone kind of a concrete example of what a launch team looks like, because it sounds great, but sometimes you just need an example. So this is my, my launch team. Um, I, again, am in my fifth year. Um, so I'm in my second year of research or ADT time, and I have two more clinical years to go. Uh, my personal interest is around, I wanna be a colorectal surgeon, um, and I focus on quality improvement research and surgical education research. Um, and this is my team that helps me do that. So Dr. Regenbogen, he's a, um, a colorectal surgeon here. He is an expert in the health sciences. He works at CHOP. Uh, Dr. Hendren is also a colorectal surgeon. She specializes in quality improvement research. So she helps me kind of create projects and learn how to do that. Um, Dr. Swanable is a colorectal surgeon here at the VA. She specializes um, actually in qualitative research. Um, so her and I work a, a lot together on things like surgery identity, the hidden curriculum, things like that. Dr. Mazur here is a um, surgeon in minimally invasive who we don't have a clinical focus uh, that is related, but she has a master's in professional health education, which I really care about. Um, so I get her expertise on educational objectives. Um, Dr. Mary Burns is a PhD sociologist here. Um, she is a expert qualitative researcher and I've learned anything I know about qualitative research from her. Um, and she helps me with my methodology, which has been really important in my world. And then obviously Dr. Gurjeet, uh, Dr. Sandhu, Rajit Sandhu, who's here on the call with us, um, she is our Vice Chair of Resident Professional Development, and she helps me kind of create programs like this um, that we can help make sure we're developing our residents appropriately and help me learn kind of the nuances of surgery resident education. So this is a group of individuals that, you know, wouldn't always meet in the same room without me, but because of my interest all combining with these folks, we meet together and it's been really, really valuable to um, kind of develop me as a researcher and a surgeon. So it's been a super successful program for me. I'm really passionate about this team that I've built for myself. It's, it's, it's great to help me uh, move forward for sure. And I'm happy to answer any questions about my launch team, um, either in the chat or um, you know via Twitter or email later on. So thanks for letting me share, guys. That was great, Sam, thank you. Um, 
so by now you guys can see that there is this thought about longitudinal investment on our residents and a lot of this actually rains on our students as well and along with the investment on resident productivity creating spaces for intentional mentorship um, was an, an area that we found to be underdeveloped in our program um, and some of it is going to be addressed through the la our launch teams that are more like you know, professional development oriented and making sure that you are progressing toward your milestones um, but then there is another aspect of like trying to make sure that you have a sense that you're building a community in a new place um, as, uh, as a new intern. So Dr. Kouache will now tell us about anastomosis uh, that is our new uh, novel surgical mentorship program. And you are muted, Dr. Kouache. Sorry about that. I'm going to share them. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear okay. you. Awesome, thank you so much, Val. And, and sorry about that, I have like these multiple screens going on, so different things happen at different spots. But hi everyone, um, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I know there are like a million and one things you can be doing, and especially with everything that's going on right now, there's a lot that is drawing our attention. And so just taking the time to be here so we can share what we love about Michigan with you, um, just want to say thank you. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, I didn't train at Michigan. Uh, one reason I came here was I was really attracted as a faculty to the intentional investment in making sure that I succeeded and that the mentorship that was created around that. Um, one thing that was unique to Michigan as a faculty was having the launch teams. And um, just seeing this replicated for our residents has been amazing. It's something I wish I had um, during my training because it definitely sets you on the right path and helps you develop all aspects of who you are. Um, and sometimes it requires that intentional, um, a team of people pouring into you intentionally and taking that journey with you in order to help you meet those goals. So um, I think it's an exciting, a unique, uh, program that is not offered in a lot of places. Um, so I'm glad you're learning a bit about it. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as faculty advice on two mentorship programs, um, one which I'll be uh, discussing right now and the second one you hear shortly after was from Dr. Val Buena. Um, so this is the anastomosis mentorship program. And for some of you, you might be wondering, why do we have another mentorship program? The launch team that has just been created or um, just been reviewed by uh, Dr. Rivard with you um, did talk about mentorship. And so why is there a need to have a second overlapping sort of program? And I think what makes anastomosis a little bit different is that it fills this unique niche that sometimes the launch teams in that more formal program might not be able to reach. Um, before I dig into what anastomosis is about, I just wanted to give a shout out to these awesome people who are actually the minds and the brains behind the program, and especially to Dr. Mary Shen. She's the one with the uh, blown up picture there. But Dr. Me uh, Mary Shen is one of our clinical residents, and she's the one who came up with the idea for anastomosis, um, just realizing that there was a need for intentional mentorship uh, within for our residents, but also uh, for some of our students. And we have um, several other residents indicated on that slide. In addition to a medical students, um, Jessica Santos Parker, who's applying in general surgery um, this year, really excited about that. And then Dr. Sandra and Dr. George. So um, the slides I'll be sharing today are primarily Dr. Shen's. Uh, so I'll give her credit and thank you for allowing me to share her work with you. Um, so there's been a lot that's been written about how surgical residency, even though it is a very fulfilling profession to go into, surgical training can be um, exhausting. It's long um, because we are sometimes in very stressful situations. Um, we find these situations that happen where people end up being mistreated. Um, there could be some verbal, physical abuse that happens, uh, some discrimination. 
And all of that over time piles up and leads to a significant amount of burnout amongst our residents. Um, the second trial, um, which was recently conducted, identified close to about 40% burnout amongst our trainees. And that is huge when you think about it. Um, given the number of people who go into surgery and to have about 40% um, having these issues. Um, of those respondents to a survey that they did, I think in 2014, 87% of the female resp respondents indicated that they had had some gender-based discrimination or um, some sort of mistreatment um, during their course of training. And that is huge. So being faced with this sort of data, um, trying to figure out what could be done about it, um, I think Dr. Shen doing due diligence and searching the literature was inspired by a lot of folks who've thought critically about this. And one particular person that um, she was inspired by was Dr. Julie Freshlack. Um, Dr. Freshlack in this quote um, notes that there's this huge tide of surgical resident attrition. And um, she identified that mentorship was one of the ways that we could address it, just looking at the literature and what all the studies were showing. Um, Dr. Freshlack went on to say that um, as educators and clinicians, we had a responsibility to cultivate and not to waste the valuable potential of our trainees, our medical students and our residents who trust us with their training and um, hope that we help create, help develop them into the excellent surgeons, clinician surgeons and thought leaders. So um, taking um, Dr. Freshless um, quote to heart, um, Dr. Shen, our resident, ended up focusing on how we could intentionally build some sort of mentorship into our residency. And she focused on mentorship because um, we're looking at more long-term processes instead of just achieving one particular task, which is sometimes what you get if you have a coach. Um, as also residents, it's very hard sometimes to leverage some of the opportunities that you get from a connector or a sponsor. And this just like um, different things have gone through are just what we think about when we um, focus on the different types of um, sponsorship or mentorship or support a trainee can get during their um, residency or um, later on in their careers. So our focus was mainly on mentorship because we had found that this improves specialty choice, academic success. Um, there's been a lot of work that shows that people um, get better and it um, is a good way to address burnout. So anastomosis actually has, and it seems like a weird choice um, of a mentorship name. I'm a colorectal surgeon and um, I hope uh, Dr. Shen was influenced by my choice of profession, but um, I think the reason she chose anastomosis was because within colorectal surgery, we're usually making connections between pieces of bowel or different things. And it is important that you make a connection that holds, otherwise you could have a lot of complications that occur. And so when we do make a connection between on anastomosis, when we are thinking about surgery, there are a lot of things we go into making that a solid, safe connection. And this is what she factored into creating um, anastomosis. So um, unlike the launch team, anastomosis actually um, revolves or is built upon a near mentorship program or system. So um, we have different uh, levels of trainees who come together in order to support but also to help people succeed by sort of filling in where some of the lunch teams or some of our other clinical research mentors might not be able to. Um, the teams are built with a medical student, um, usually is a second year medical student. Um, some of the teams have one uh, that have two medical students. There's a first year intern, and this was the first year we had a, a program, but as a first year intern and um, then there's an ADT resident. Um, the ADT resident is actually um, the foundation on which this is built. They are the ones who sort of drive the program and drive the connections that are made. And then there's a faculty mentor who sort of oversees everything and provides near mentorship 
uh, for the ADT resident. And you can see how that is built in a tier system. So the teams are matched both with conventional and unconventional methods. So conventional methods would be we had people submit what their general interests were, specialty interests, research hobbies. And then um, our resident team who um, designed anastomosis tend to, of course, the in websites because um, they are the best when it comes to making matches. But they looked at stuff like um, you had to say if you liked horror movies or not, if you wanted to sell everything in your life and live on a boat, well, would you do that? Have you traveled to a foreign country for fun? But all these random questions to see whether we could match people better. And the programs, um, the teams meet every three months or so. Initially it was over food and drinks in different locations, but because of COVID we've moved it to a virtual format. And there's a lot of coaching that happens, but there's also literature-based discussion. And this is just to give you some of the things we sort of review over the year. And so it's how do you pick a good mentor, mentee, how you a good mentor, time management, um, dealing with microaggressions, um, focusing on diversity within our various spaces, and then finding that work-life balance. So you can see again, sort of the things we cover are slightly different from what happens in the launch, the launch team setting. So I'm gonna go really quickly through our teams. Uh, just wanted to highlight by showing you the pictures, how diverse these teams are. So it goes from the faculty to the left, um, the ADT residents, the next, and then our intern and our medical students. But you can see that all of these teams are pretty diverse. Um, this is my particular team, which is really cool. I get to hang out with um, Dr. Melvin, Dr. Baimi, and then uh, Janine Nesbitt. Um, we recently featured some of our uh, participants on our blog. And this is a comment from Dr. Baimi. She moved from the East Coast here, and she knows that her anastomosis family has helped her really um, settle and adjust to living in Ann Arbor. And this was despite moving here in the middle of the pandemic and not having an, uh, the usual support systems. So the anastomosis team or mention team um, ended up forming a critical backbone for her. Um, this is Dr. McGuire's team. Uh, she, she jokes that she has a team of boys and it's awesome. She really loves uh, mentoring this group. Um, and then there's Dr. Mazer. Uh, Dr. Howard is the resident on Dr. Mazer's team, and then he comments that um, the anastomosis program has been a crucial addition to his uh, training. Um, it's helped him, just having those regular meetings have helped him discuss and practice mentorship skills that have helped him intentionally grow. And I think this is just a testament to how effective the program has been over a short period of time. And this is Dr. Scott's team. And this is uh, Dr. Swanable, and you can see Dr. Valbuena is our ADT resident there. Uh, Dr. Swanable, as the faculty, has absolutely loved meeting with her team. I know they meet even more frequently than the every three months that it's allotted, and they've done a lot of fun. <laughs> <and that's it. laughs> That's uh, yeah, all Dr. Me. Swanable is like, you guys are always over in her house, but yes. Um, <laughs> So the team has allowed her to uh, provide support for her mentees and guidance, and it's just allowed her to um, really uh, thrive or make uh, situations happen for their training that goes beyond just a clinical setting, and that is crucial. And this is Dr. Wade's team. And so um, this is just a very brief overview of what um, the anastomosis program has been. Uh, what I love about Michigan's not a core strength is the fact that a lot of our initiatives are resident or student initiated or um, run. Um, our residents come up with tremendous ideas um, and they put in the hard work. And as a faculty mentor on these programs, it's just been a joy to see something taken from an idea or conception and then created into this program. That's making a true difference in people's lives. And I want to hand over to Dr. Valbuena to share with you another program which she sort of developed and has really taken from an idea into something amazing. Thank you, Dr. Kowache. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Are you seeing the screen and on my notes? Yes. Um, thank you. So, 
as we're looking at the training continuum and what the roles that um, residents are playing in kind of shaping the culture of Michigan and the things that we're doing, um, I always reflected upon the reasons that brought me here and how my interest has always been focused on how we can make the dream of becoming a surgeon available to everybody, um, not just the students that traditionally have been able to access the opportunities and the resources that put you in the position to be able to make an ask for, uh, for a place like ours and just for the specialty in general. So with this in mind, I partnered with a talented group of Michigan medical students to create leagues, uh, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, which is our first preclinical pre pipeline program here at Michigan Surgery. Thanks. Um, so many of you might be familiar with the concept of the leaky training pipeline of medicine or students from at-risk backgrounds are falling off the educational continuum as early as kindergarten, which is limiting the talent pool of medicine as a whole and also of surgical specialties like ours. And some of these leaky joints that you see in this slide uh, correspond to issues that many of you might be familiar with, such as lack of family financial resources, adequate mentorship, and then the effects of systemic racism on any, everything from undergraduate to medical training to residency. And so with this in mind, we developed the Leagues Fellowship as a novel surgical pipeline program. I was inspired by being uh, the beneficiary of a lot of pipeline programs that have brought me here um, to Michigan Surgery. And this program aims to develop future surgeon leaders who are invested in diversity, equity, and inclusion for patients and students, and also the rest of professionals that work with us in academic surgery. Um, our program aimed to accomplish this through like a three-angled approach, mentorship, uh, academic support and research opportunities, and clinical experience. And so we created this four-week uh, fellowship program uh, that included six core components that you can see in the slide here, from recruitment to interviewing, uh, participating, our participating fellows, um, seminars and workshops, research, and then surgical skills and community building. And as you're hearing all of this kind of elements, it's like, oh, these are all the ingredients of the soup. And let me tell you, some people don't have some of this, even after they have made it to medical school, even after you are at the point in which like everybody should be in a level playing field, the field is never leveled. Um, we advertise for this program over social media. Um, we use our contacts with national underrepresented in medicine student groups and recruited rising second year medical students to participate over the summer between their M1 and M2 years. Um, everybody has a different curriculum now, but in a traditional curriculum, that's like your last summer of medical school. Some of you might have one, I had one. Um, and I didn't have money to pay for rent that summer. So it's really hard to engage in research when you're also trying to, to pay the bills. Um, so our application collected some basic demographic information and it consisted of uh, the three short response questions aimed at trying to assess the student's interest in surgery whether they were interested in research, research was not required, um, and whether or not they had a commitment, a demonstrated commitment to diversity um, on provider teams and equitable healthcare. We received many applications, uh, and it was a joy to read them. They came from all over the US and Puerto Rico, and three applicants from an outstanding pool were selected to participate uh, on our pilot program, which just happened um, this summer. And we had originally intended for this to be like, when I came to research, so I'm in my first year of research and I was gonna come out and we we're gonna implement this program and I was, gonna, I was gonna be able to take the students to the operating room and then COVID happened. And so what we had originally intended to be an in-person uh, research fellowship um, and we laid all the foundation for this ended up becoming a virtual opportunity. Um, and there was a point in which we needed to decide whether or not um, the program was going to be worth it, but we felt that with the COVID pandemic leagues was even like needed even more because so many students had been impacted uh, with cancel oper in-person opportunities. Um, and so we moved right along. Um, and this took a lot of work um, and I did not do this alone. So we moved forward with converting the entire program to virtual. Uh, this is a screenshot of my elaborate Google calendar uh, for one of our fellows. And in many ways the, the virtual uh, format made it simpler to schedule some of the uh, like the mentorship components, the Zoom meetings. Uh, you're seeing the snapshot here and there is uh, there are things that were happening every single day. And we found it very important to provide, um, uh, to figure out a way to provide a stipend for our fellows, even though with COVID-19 the fund situation changed. Like I mentioned earlier, and many of you might know, 
when you we don't have any financial aid during that summertime. And so if somebody is going to be able to take advantage of a research opportunity or an like overseas tree, all of these things that like make you a good applicant, um, not having funds, not being able to afford that, like creates a disparity in what those uh, on those access to those opportunities. Um, so we actually received a very generous private gift and we were able to provide our fellows with a stipend to cover their effort instead of asking them for them to participate um, uh, for free, which we felt very strongly was gonna increase the equity of access to the opportunity. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure the fellows' engagement with the program reflected their interest, um, and they, we performed an incoming interview for the three of them to try to see where they were coming from, like what were they hoping to get. A lot of them had no experience with research. They didn't have a home surgery department. They didn't know what they wanted to do. And this was an opportunity as much for them to benefit as for us to be able to open the doors of our specialty to them. We found that fellows unanimously had a strong interest in the surgical specialty and surgery as a specialty and a desire to have a career working with minority patients and improving representation in academic medicine. Um, this was a large motivation for them to actually participate in leagues and our fellows also came in, as I said, with very little, little research experience or surgical mentorship and they were worried about pursuing a surgical career given both how competitive it is and also the stereotype of a hostile surgical culture with high rates of burnout across the country. Um, they also had a perception that success in surgery was dependent on networking and being well connected. And so if you happen to be, maybe you get into medical school, but maybe you don't have a surgery department or maybe people at your surgery department don't do research. And so it can be very challenging for students to kind of network their way in. Um, so what did we do during this month? Uh, the program ran this past July. So I finished, I did my last emergency case on June 29. And then on July 1st, we had our first session for leads. Um, the program um, ran with, we couldn't have run without the support of, of our Michigan family. So there were over 30 Michigan faculty and residents uh, that participated uh, in the program. Each week, the fellows attended lectures, workshops uh, that were conducted by our faculty and residents, and also our senior medical students, as this program was completely run by, by our senior medical students who might be applying with you guys this season. Um, there was a heavy component of peer mentorship and then also uh, focus on, get, on how to get involved in advocacy as a trainee for these uh, students that have like a strong interest in social justice, like trying to figure out a way in which you can balance a basic career as a surgeon, a researcher, and also an activist, like seems like an impossible thing. So we had some sessions um, designed to teach them about that. Um, the lecture portion of the sessions were recorded and then we shared them on our department's YouTube channel, which was one of the unforeseen benefits of actually going virtual was that we were able to actually increase the footprint of the content um, in, in a time in which a lot of students were looking for additional opportunities. Um, we really want to make sure that the fellows were engaged in research. As you guys know better than anybody, academic productivity has become a, like a desired currency for um, residency applications. Um, and so making sure that we open opportunities for them to be able to be academically active were, was very important. And it was a hefty goal to be able to do this in four weeks. However, our, we were able to identify faculty mentors um, that have projects that were able to be conducted remotely and within the time frame of the fellowship. And we had a really excelling experience. And here are our uh, three uh, faculty members for our pilot year that include Dr. Inglesby, who talked today. Uh, one of the components that had the biggest twist was that we were hoping to actually introduce you to surgery, which you know, taking care of patients in the uh, outside of the operating room is half of what I, of what we do. And then, but the OR uh, is a big part of our lives and learning about like learning to suture and, and having an introduction to the procedural aspect of surgery was important. Um, but our uh, two of our uh, medical student leaders, uh, Jessica and Kelly Santos Parker, actually figure out a way of teaching our students how to suture over Zoom. And so we created this uh, care packages with the appropriate materials. And then we had, um, we had sessions uh, that we conducted remotely, which was actually pretty awesome and something that has paid off uh, in a number of ways. Um, one important part that we didn't wanna lose with having to do this virtually was building a sense of community um, for the students. And so to achieve this, the leadership of leagues, um, we, we had like time in between seminars in which we socialized with students but also dedicated uh, time outside of the seminars in which we do that as well.
And um, four weeks, again, seems like a short time, but this is a sample of the projects that our scholars were able, able to complete under four weeks things with us at leagues. Um, there were like solid, amazing projects that I was incredibly proud to, see, proud to see them completed. And in terms of deliverables, all of them submitted abstracts uh, for one of our larger surgical conferences, and two of them are currently working on manuscripts. I actually just finished reviewing one of them, um, and it's getting very close, and this is for a student that had no previous experience doing the research. Um, one, of, one of the most important part for us was to capture the impact of the, that the program had on the fellows. So the next couple of slides just have a couple of quotes. Uh, we conducted some post interviews after the program, and overwhelmingly, all of them felt like they get gaining valuable research experience, um, but also a sense of community and what a feeling of what surgery was really about. Um, they also gained a new perspective on the type of research that was being done performed by surgeons uh, and the health services research and disparities research is being done by surgeons. Um, and so it was very special for us to see that that had like that had been communicated through the program. And as far as like the the kind of phenotype of student that we were able to benefit to uh, a benefit with the program, two of our fellows didn't have a home surgical department. As I mentioned, they didn't have any research experience. And then many fellows were originally very hesitant about like the perceived culture of surgery um, and the um, like the issues that might arise when you're even considering it, like discounting it before you even think about it. So seeing that their perspectives around it had already changed in the short term was very meaningful. Uh, one goal of leaks was to be able to create a lineage of mentors. So we had um, we are going to be having our second um, our second installment of leaks next year, and uh, the students like demonstrate a lot of interest and actually participated in taking back what they had learned to their institution. And all of this sounds awesome, but none of this was easy, and uh, it was actually incredibly challenging, and we had to troubleshoot a lot. And in some ways we're like, oh, we did this, we did this, and these are what, what the students got. But like our institution and like the faculty and the residents uh, gained a lot. And I gained a lot of experience both putting a program like this together and then the residents and faculty and the students, because we had a lot of students involved, mentoring across geographical barriers and then seeing what it actually takes to do like this type of diversity work. And so as we're looking into the future, uh, we're getting ready, getting ready for 2021 uh, and things are gonna be hard we don't know if we're going to be in person we're working on long term on long-term funding and then on making sure that we don't over utilize like the key resource of this program which is the time and energy of our faculty and residents um but we're excited for it and this is a great opportunity i'm hoping that it becomes an opportunity in which residents and students here at michigan surgery are able to participate in really meaningful uh, diversity pipeline work um maybe some of you will be joining me next year um and that is all i have um this is my team they are awesome dr kuache who's here too is our faculty advisor these are my awesome four medical students that make this possible so thank you very much uh for your attention uh and we will move on to the q a fantastic thank you everybody for your incredible presentations so we've been trying to keep on top of the Q&A and the chat. So I think we're up to speed, but I have a, a question for all of you. You've talked a lot about what uh, the department can do for learners, what you as individual faculty and residents can do for learners. I'd like to hear from you, what can mentees do to be the best mentee in order to advance the, the mentoring relationship and make sure that it's um, effectively moving along? Um, Dr. Inglesby, can we start with you? Uh, sure. Um, so part of the expectations it, uh, in the curriculum is, you know, we, we need, we do, and we need to teach you how to be a good mentee. Um, I think that's half of the game. I guess my pointers for mentees would be, um, uh, be available. I think when you're clinical, uh, in the clinical phases, there's no expectation you're going to kind of like answer emails. But when you're doing research, then you need to um, respond to opportunities too is, um, you got to hop on the excellence train like there's so many opportunities and you just need to be kind of quote a joiner and take advantage of it of them when they come along and then three i think it comes down to kind of being a good steward of the culture of, of the place so you have to take advantage of um all the opportunities so for example i've learned so much from all these folks on the on this call um, around the expectations and cultural norms of our department um, 
and that change, you know, every year, year on year. And as a mentee, you have to be up to date as to what the cultural expectations are of our department. Um, I guess those are my three pointers, but others will have a better answer, I'm sure. Dr. Kwachi, what are some of your ideas? I, I personally agree with uh, Dr. Anglesby. Um, I think what is also cool, and it's so interesting to bring that up, Dr. Sanju, because I have my mentoring guide here, my little, <laughs> which is a lot of the stuff. Uh, this is by Dr. Chobra, Dr. Vaughn, and Dr. Saint. And if any of our students want to go out and get this book, I highly recommend it. It's called The Mentoring Guide. But it goes through like how to be an awesome mentee, how to identify the right, right mentors. I think one of the questions we had in the chat is, how do you go about doing this? And this is a formal, informal process. And a lot of what we've talked about has been formal processes, but it, there's also a lot on how do you succeed as a mentee, but also identify when you're doing things not the right way or not with a pair of the right mentor. And one thing, um, a couple of things they talk about is communicating, taking some responsibility on your own, sort of doing the hard work of trying to identify who you are and what your why is. And I think some of that work has to be done early on and revised over time. But they also uh, focus on, you know, not taking on too much. So there's this whole thing they talk about being an overcommitter. And so you commit to too much and then it's like not knowing how to say, note certain opportunities and i think that's where the launch teams are very very great i'm on one residence launch team and we are all about no 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 uh, let's cut back a little bit um but there's also stuff about ghosting where you sort of avoid your mentors or your mentoring team or different probably because you've overcommitted to stuff but there's a lot in this book which goes into it but knowing the culture like dr Inglesby said doing well, communicating and asking those tough questions you are doing right now, being curious and trying to stay engaged is very important. Thank you. Would you like to add anything from the learner perspective, Dr. Valbuena? Um, yes, so there's a caveat to my answer and is that I am a current mentee, as maybe most of the people on the call are. And so when Dr. And Dr. Gwach is actually one of my mentors. Um, and, and so, there is this there is this lack of linearity to the process in which like you're like you're never not necessarily in that hot seat like there's always someone to answer to and there's a lot of learning on how to manage when mentorship and, and development and doing things and producing knowledge is such an important part of what you do it's not something that you're gonna fall onto and then just like be a hundred percent you're like the best mentee so we actually do a lot of training around this just to learn like, the book and we also have like sessions, like whole like curriculums around trying to teach people, every single person how to be a good mentor, but also how to be a good mentee. And this is for every single person in our department, they're playing this dual role. Uh, I do it with my students. I have a group of, I have, you know, over like seven or eight students that I'm like directly mentoring. And so being able to switch and then seeing like the things that my students are doing and reflecting it on what, how I'm doing, so everybody has, I have done all of the terrible sins that Dr. Kuache has listed. I have ghosted, I have disappeared, I have like pushed things off and then like being able to learn from that and have a team of people point it out to you so that then you can like relate that knowledge down to your students and create this kind of lineage of mentorship is very important. Uh, and something that I think that now that I have uh, kind of dedicated time to think about, I, I'm really thankful for being in a setting in which, you know, not, Ghosting your mentor is not like, oh my God, you you shall be shunned from academic development. It's like unexpected behavior that will be like you will learn about and then you will correct and then you will teach somebody else about. Thank you. Dr. Vard, I'm gonna start the next question with you, which is what happens if the mentoring team isn't going the way you had hoped it would? What what suggestions do you have? Yeah, so that's a great point. So a lot of times, um, this happened to me too, I come in as an intern and you have one career focus in mind and, and when you actually are doing the work, you determine what you want to do is totally different. For instance, I wanted to be a pediatric surgeon when I got here, it was my goal. Uh, and then I realized that I'm more apt to being a colorectal surgeon and that's kind of where I want my career to go. So, so <laughs> my pathway has changed for sure. Um, these mentorship teams that we've created are totally flexible and everything that I've realized is all the mentors are super supportive of whatever you wanna do. And if you end up changing your path, that's okay. And, and 
mentors want to find the right mentors for you. So for instance, I have a couple colleagues who either started out in basic science or started out in health services research and decided to change their minds because that's not what they ended up wanting to do. Um, and that process for them, while a struggle in total, was actually very supported. We had an, um, a first year in the academic development time um, who was in a basic science lab who her actual launch team was the ones who helped her recognize that's not something she wanted to do. And she was more apt to a career in health services research uh, based on the things that she said. So the launch teams actually help you figure out where you wanna go and sometimes help you figure out you're not on the right path and help direct you to those people. So if you have people on your launch team or mentors in your first year and your intern year, you can totally change that and you can change the path um, and those people hold no grudges against you and they really just want what's best for you. So they'll help identify who's best for you and move on. So it's super flexible. No one should be worried about, you know, not changing their paths because they've already had these mentors. It's flexible. Things change. You have different interests when you're actually doing the work. So I hope that helps. Very helpful. Dr. Inglesby, we've had several questions about faculty accessibility. How often do people meet? Could you talk a bit about that relationship and how faculty invest in, in that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as faculty, we're here to work with students and residents. I mean, that is a priority for every single one of us. So, um, uh, so it's, it's a, quite a different dynamic than when you're kind of a medical student where you feel like you're bothering faculty. I think, you know, I think I work a lot with Val um, and recently Sam, we've been working a lot together and there's a full expectation they would call me ad hoc on my cell phone or I would answer and we do uh, expeditiously. So I think faculty in general fall over themselves to have the honor um, of working with residents, uh, particularly in their academic development time. So I think it's the hard part for the residents is how to kind of keep all that attention away. So how do you, that's what the launch teams in part are for. So how do you, um, cause you have so many mentors. So uh, faculty are all in. Um, and I think I speak for the vast majority of the faculty that it is really a, a, one of the key, if not the key par, uh, part of their job that they enjoy the most, which is working with the brilliant residents. So before I hand it off to Dr. Rivard to close out, Dr. Kwachi, what pearl or what last piece of advice do you have for incoming residents with respect to mentorship? That's a tough one, Dr. Sandu, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, um, I think, again, just to emphasize that this is an amazing place. And I don't say that lightly. I've had an opportunity to train at some extraordinary places. But what makes Michigan stand out is this focus on making you the best version of you and who, whatever that is you want to be. And uh, you're going to have people who come alongside you and are eager to um, go on that journey with you. And um, it might seem difficult to go out searching for mentors, but we will sort of be knocking at your door instead and be like, what are you up to? What can we help you with? Um, I do have to say um, that um, I know there are a few comments about diversity and then being a minority and just addressing that. And I know we focus our discussion on clinical research sort of mentorship, but there are people here who are willing and committed to mentoring you whatever, whoever you are and whatever you bring to that to the table, however you define yourself, um, you're going to find mentors. And if we can't provide that mentorship, we'll create a team or connect you, we'll find that for you. And it is um, a pleasure for me to serve as a minority woman, as a mentor to various folks in that space, or be those interested in global, but just saying whoever you are, we can meet you where you need in terms of your mentorship needs. That is great. Uh, I think we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you very much, everybody who called in today. Um, we are really looking forward to meeting uh, some of you during the interview cycle. If there is any additional questions, a couple of us placed our uh, emails on the chat. You can feel free to reach over social media. Our Instagram, our um, Twitter handles are uh, on our Zoom screens. And then um, thank you very much for spending some time with us today.